Welcome back to the channel family. Thanks for tuning in. We are in Isaiah chapter 42. Um, we're going to be doing an exposition of the latter half of the chapter. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and read the whole thing to get us going. Behold my servant whom I upholdeth, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I will put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the nations. He shall not cry nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment according to truth. He shall not faint nor be in haste, till he have set justice in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Thus says God, Yahweh, he that stretched out the heavens, created them, he that spread forth the earth and its productions, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. I, Yahweh, have called thee in righteousness, and I will take hold of thine hand, I will preserveth thee and give thee for a covenant of the peoples, for a light of the nations, to open the blind eyes, to bring forth the prisoner from the prison, those that sitteth in darkness out of the house of restraint. I am Jehovah, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, neither my praise to graven images, Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, will I cause you to hear them. Sing unto Yahweh a new song, his praise from the end of the earth. Ye that go down to the sea, and all that is therein, the isles and their inhabitants, let the wilderness and the cities thereof lift up their voice. The villages that Kedar doth inhabit. Let the inhabitants of the rock sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory unto Jehovah and declare his praise in the islands. Jehovah will go forth like a mighty man. He will stir up, stir up a yellow of the sea. Like a man of war, he will cry. Yea, he will shout. He will show himself mighty against his enemies. Long time have I holden my peace. I have been still. I have restrained myself. I will cry like a woman that travaileth. I will blow and pant. All at once. I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their herbs. I will make the rivers islands and I will dry up the pools and I will bring the blind by a way that they know not. In paths that they know not will I lead to them. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them, and not forsake them. They shall be turned back. They shall be covered with shame, that confide in graven images, that say to the molten images, You are our gods. Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that ye may see. Who is blind but my servant, and deaf as my messenger whom I sent? Who is blind as he in whom I have trusted? And blind as Jehovah's servant, seeing many things and thou observest not. With opened ears he heareth not. Jehovah has delight in him, for his righteousness' sake. He hath magnified the law and made it honourable. But this is a people's robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes and hidden in prison houses. 
They are become a prey and no one delivers. No one delivereth. A spoil and none saith restoreth. Who among thee wilt give ear to this? Who wilt hearken and hear what is to come? Who gave Jacob for a spoil and Israel to the robbers? Did not Jehovah, he against whom we have sinned? And they would not walk in his ways, neither did they hearken unto his law. And he hath poured upon him the fury of his anger and the strength of battle, and it set him on fire round about, yet he knew not, and it burned him, yet he took it not to heart. So there we have it, friends, the second half of Yeshaya chapter 42. It's a very, very powerful chapter. Now, we had a part one to this chapter, friends, uh, wherein we expounded uh, concisely yet somewhat thoroughly the first half of the chapter. So we're going to be taking a look from, well, we'll start at verse 12. Let them give glory unto Yahovah and declare his praise in the islands. Yahovah shall go forth like a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. Now, Yahovah is a man of war. We find that uh, elsewhere in the, the prophet. I believe you only get that in, in Isaiah, you know. If I, if I just, using the Bible gateway, put in um, man of war, there will be others. There'll be quite a few results for this, I think, because, oh, 40, yes. There you go. Exodus 15, 3, 153. Yahovah is a man of war. Yahovah is his name. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. So that's the first mention of man of war in the scripture. Exodus 1, 5, 3. That's the grace of deity in triune expression. Yahweh is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. Now, um, so, yeah, so you get that in Exodus. I'm just wondering why else it appears. I'm sure it appears. Oh, well, first Samuel 16, 18 speaks of, of King David, speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ being a mighty, valiant man and a man of war, prudent in matters, a comely person, and the wise with him. Um, now, look here. Yes, it's something that a lot of believers don't realize that Yahweh is a man of war. You see? Now, Yes, it's interesting. I, I think, I think all, all we basically have is that reference in Exodus 15, 3. And then here in our text today, in verse 13, it says, Yahweh shall go forth like a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. Now, jealousy is one of the few traits that in mortals is often not a good thing. And yet, it is one of the character attributes of Yah Elohim. Yah is a yellowless god. Uh, a yellowless god. Now, um, Zya is the French word for I. Al is the Hebrew word for God. O, Uz, Y. Yellow, well, you don't necessarily need the Y on the end. Uh, Zya, Al, I, God, O, Uz. 
Jealous, uh, um, and of course, Jesus. And so it is that simple, friends. Where the word us appears, it speaks of the collective. Uh, and God is a jealous God, uh, which means that any mortals that are alive are preserved by the character, nature, and attributes eternal in loving kindness and Jewish prudential mercy. Now, the answer of the tongue is from Yahuwah. The voice of Yahuwah is in all creation, sustaining the whole planet and everything living. The great verse, you know, the Lord shall go forth as a mighty man, shall stir up jealousy as a man of war, he shall we cry, yea, roar, he shall prevail against his enemies. So what you have here in these chapters uh, is a deliberate declaration of the character, counsel, and personage eternal. Now, the ancient of days, the father of eternity in full revelation. That's what you have here, friends, here can us. Uh, these chapters uh, in, in Isaiah uh, would be the clearest and strongest uh, and uh, voluptuous in, in quantity, these scriptures here um, would be uh, where you ought to be going to find out about El Elohim Yahweh, about God. Uh, and so here you have it, you see. Um, it is the jealousy of God that has preserved every human being throughout time upon the cross. You know, some of the recorded words of Christ upon the cross are, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Uh, and woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. Um, and so that's reconciliation, you see, with the last words of the last book, as recorded in the scripture, uh, Malachi chapter 4, it says that the great prophet will come and turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the children to the parents, you see. And then the words of Christ to his mother, his natural mother was woman, behold your son to the beloved disciple John, and, and, and John, behold your mother. Um, and so that's reconciliation. Christ has reconciled all men to God. Uh, but we know that not all men will be saved. Uh, Christ will decide these things. Now, it's a great scripture. It's a great scripture. Uh, I have a long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now I will cry like a travailing woman. This is a very, very rare scripture. And I do so like the rare scriptures. I will cry, Yahweh says, like a travailing woman. Who would have thought it? God crying like, like when it says travailing, that means giving birth. Uh, you wouldn't ordinarily think that Yah Elohim would cry like a woman giving birth, but that's what it says. Now it's this speaks of creation and redemption. Uh, and it speaks of the bringing forth, all this planet is waiting for the revelation of the sons of God, the New Testament tells us. We read of, now in Scripture, friends, you will often, uh, there are various themes in Scripture, friends, that I often speak about. Mountains, um, sea, trees, the first man, the second man, um, and woman. Now, Jehovah says to Israel, I am your husband. Uh, now, whenever you see a woman in scripture, it either speaks of the first woman, Hayah, Eve. Um, it speaks of Israel, the woman. Um, it speaks of the church, the redeemed, the congregation. Um, and if you look in uh, Revelation 
where are we? Revelation, I believe, and they show like they find a few quickly friends. There we are, Revelation 12, you see? And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And upon her head a crown of 12 stars, and she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Well, that's Israel, you see? Um, a crown of 12 stars, that's the 12 sons of Israel, 12 tribes of Israel. The woman is literally Israel, uh, clothed with the sun that speaks of the will of the creator and the creative power and the creative mind. Um, the moon, as I intimated in the previous broadcast, uh, the moon has no natural light of its own, but simply reflects the light of the sun in the same way that mortal Christians reflect the light of Christ, having no light of their own. Um, and of course, the child is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can read about that in Revelation 12, uh, friends. But in our text here, we, we know she brings forth a man-child, which is the Lord Jesus. Now, you have the great leveling through the finished work of the cross making waste mountains and hills the high places of men's and devils you have the great leveling the blind being brought by a way they don't know and led into paths they've not known I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight these things will I do to them and not forsake them. Never will I leave thee or forsake thee. Behold, I am with thee always, even unto the end of the year. Now, all those who trust in graven images shall be turned back. Those that don't worship the creator, worship the creature. I spoke to a man last year and he said he worships his wife. So I said to him, if you don't worship the creator, you will worship the creature. And that indeed is what he'd been doing. Uh, and from one perspective, all mortals, naturally speaking, are somewhat graven images. Uh, that is to say, they are formed um, and their names are written in a book and everything is known about them um, and they are uh, creature possessions and unfortunately uh, after the curse that first woman's womb becoming a tomb everyone born out of it went to the grave so they are graven in that respect now the theme of image in scripture is a very interesting one uh, mankind, the first man and woman was made in the image of God. But we know um, that the woman listened to the devil and became deluded and got into sin. And so she was cursed. And then the man uh, got into sin. So the woman believed the deluded devil. Uh, and then the man believed the deluded woman. Um, and they both chose to have the knowledge of evil and good. Uh, and from that, once the curse was given, then everyone that's ever lived, uh, apart from the living of the present time, of course, uh, went to the grave. So they were graven. Now, um, we read elsewhere that the face of Jesus Christ was more marred than any man's. Um, the image of Yahweh is still in many ways in mortals, of course, every mortal being very precious. Um, but you have the face of Elohim Yahweh towards all mankind. Um, you have the rock of ages. All flesh lives in the rock of ages in the ancient of days. Uh, in me, you all live and move and have your being. All humans. 
No. Now, you see, so it talks here in our verse here about humans that trust in graven images. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means people that trust in things that are made, that which is seen, that which is external, like homes or vehicles or furniture or clothes, covetousness, idolatry, that which is external. They shall be ashamed. That say to the molten images, you are our gods. Hear you deaf, look you blind that you may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger that I send? Who is blind as he that is perfect, and blind as Yahovah's servant? This is a very unusual verse. Very, very unusual. Um, now, I think you get another verse similar to that elsewhere, but it's, it's not something that's very common in scripture. Um, well, it speaks of the purpose of Christ being atonement and redemption and salvation. The intents and thoughts of the heart is for the well-being of all mankind. So, so Christ, it clearly has Christ in view. Um, and it speaks of the divine nature, I think, simply caring for the well-being of mortals. I think that's what that speaks of. Um, how would I give a metaphor to, to explain that? Well, I mean, if you look at canines, God's masterpiece, uh, a dog, a canine is, is an absolute masterpiece. Um, you know, friendly, loving, um, tolerant. You know, take a look at, at a dog, for example. You know, the nature of a dog is loving and compassionate and understanding. Well, that's, a, that's the divine nature, see? Uh, we can all think of family members that are very patient and long-suffering, uh, and that's the divine nature. We can perhaps think of spouses or, or even children or parents or other relatives. Perhaps our bosses, our colleagues, very patient and very long-suffering. Uh, so it speaks of motives and intent pure intent, uh, gracious, without expectations, loving and forgiving. Uh, the capacity of Christ to forgive sins, that's what that speaks of, by way of expiation and acceptance. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect, and blind as Yahuwah's servant? It speaks of being loving, tolerant, and forgiving, and compassionate. Seeing many things, but thou observest not. Opening the ears, but he heareth not. It also speaks of the deity of the Christ God. Because Christ being deity, Christ is triune and the bride. See? The seven-horned, seven-eyed Lamb of God, all-knowing all-seeing and all-powerful, see? So from one perspective, friends, there's nothing any mortal could say to Christ that he doesn't, he couldn't already know that they're going to say, let's put it that way, uh, if, if God revealed it to him. The mystery is that Christ is the head of every man, but the head of Christ is God, see? So if God was to reveal it to Christ, then Christ would already know what a mortal was going to say beforehand. And also, there's nothing any mortal could say to Christ that's going to be a benefit to Christ, because Christ is deity, Christ is God. So, um, they, you know, mortals couldn't inform deity, the creator of anything. It's the other way around. God is all-knowing and all-seeing. So when mortals come to God, they're coming to a person who already knows everything they could say or think before they say it or think it. Mortals exist for the divine pleasure by the will of God.
the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness' sake. He will magnify the law and make it horrible. Well, the law is wholly just and good. There's nothing wrong with the law, with British law. Well, some of the laws are a bit, a bit uh, awkward, I suppose, but there's nothing wrong with, with most of British law, for example. The law is a very, very good thing. Uh, but peace on this planet in cities and towns and families is by the grace of Elohai Yehovah, not by the law. Human beings are governed through the conscience. Yahweh is well pleased for his own righteousness' sake. He will magnify the law. Christ didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. To show that the law is righteous, holy, just, and good. The sinless son of God. Yahweh is well pleased for his righteousness' sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. Verse 22. So this is Isaiah 4222. This is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes. They are hid in prison houses. Behold, they are for a prey and no one delivers, for a spoil and no one says restore. So this verse, uh, Isaiah 4, 2, 2, 2, speaks of the Son of God uh, in his feelings for mankind pre-incarnation. That is to say, when the Father said, who shall go? And the Son said, behold, here am I, I shall go. You see, so this is the observations of Christ concerning the difficulties that humans face and the willingness to be the deliverer, the redeemer, the saviour, the king, and the sovereign Jewish prudential, loving and gracious, all-knowing saviour God. Now, and there you have in that verse, great revelation, friend. Human beings don't like to think of themselves as being robbed and spoiled. If you was to ask the average British citizen, are you robbed and spoiled? They'd say, certainly not. I have my wallet in my pocket. There's my car and my home. I'm not robbed or spoiled. Oh, no, no. You've been robbed and spoiled. No, 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 no. Yes. You've been robbed and spoiled. No, no, we haven't. <laughs> yes, you have. Robbed and spoiled by the wiles of the vile devile. Ye must become rich. I counsel you to buy of me gold and silver, that you may become rich on the eye salve of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit who sank to it. The Ruach HaAmeit, the Heilige Geist, that thou mayest be content, that thou mayest be gladdened and cheered and hearten. Tells you there that mankind is robbed and spoiled. What do you think? It's normal for mortal people speak of death. By natural causes. There's nothing natural about death. Death is deeply unnatural. There is nothing natural about death. Death exists because of sin. And sin exists because of Satan. And Satan exists because of his wickedness. And his arrogance and proud. Uh, greedy, covetous, lustful nature. Never give expression to the nature of the devil, mortals. Although almost every mortal doth. They are snared in holes. How are mortals snared in holes? So not only are mortals in prison, they are trapped in holes. 
You see, this is the kind of scripture that humans don't like to think about. They've already been robbed and spoiled. They don't know about it. They didn't know what they didn't know. Trapped in holes. In what way are mortals trapped in holes? Well, their circumstances, their situations, if they've been slanderous, if they've been covetous, if they've been lustful, if they've been violent, uh, they are trapped by their words and behavior. They're accountable before Yahuwah. All mortals are accountable for every thought, word, and deed. And they are held unless they repent of their sin, their witchcraft, their sorcery, their fornication, their lies, then they will perish in their sins and be lost and damned from life eternal. It tells you they are for a prey and no one delivers for a spoil. So it gets worse. This is Isaiah 4, triple two. Um, mortals are robbed and, and spoiled. So there'll be meanings to that. Mortals have been robbed by the devil and ruined by the devil. One thing to be robbed, it's another thing to be ruined. If you was mugged in the street and the mugger got your Rolex and your, your wallet, that would be one thing. But if he took your Rolex and wallet and beat you about the head and body till you were black and blue, well, that would be you spoiled, you see. Mankind has been robbed and spoiled. And all mankind is snared in holes, all adults, uh, all dulled persons, dull. Mm. It tells you that they are hidden in prison houses. Now, so this is the Son of God, aware of the condition of mankind before incarnation in willingness to rescue and redeem all mankind in benevolence and compassion and loving kindness. That's what this is. Christ saw the condition of mortals, saw all their problems, all their situations, all their circumstances. And how they were helpless, in prison, robbed, spoiled and snared. And for a prey to the devil. Those that do not pray, P-R-A-Y, are a prey, P-R-E-Y, very often. And no one delivereth for a spoil. And no one says, restore. So they're already robbed and spoiled and snared. And yet, there's more spoiling um, to come. So they've got to be helped. Mortals are saved, being saved, and will be saved. And no one says restore. That's where we are now. At the end of the church age, the fullness, the consummation of the ages, the Lamb's marriage supper, a global resurrection of hundreds of millions of human beings clothed with immortality, phys physical immortality, real immortality, friends. The marriage supper, the thousand-year millennial kingdom. That's where we are. The chronology of things. We are in the very, very last moments of time as men know it. The time of the rule of men and devils has come to an end. The kingdom of Elohim Yahweh is throughout this sphere. Elohim Yahweh doth rule over all things right now, dear Kunas beloved. Who among you will give ear to this? And who will hearken and hear for the time to come? Who among you will give ear to this? And who will hearken and hear for the time to come. So that's very interesting. It's like he who has an ear to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let him hear in Revelation. Who gave Yaakov for a spoil and Israel to the robbers? Well, God 
when when the curse came upon mankind, God gave the curse upon mankind. Now, in order for mankind to be saved, um, Israel was given to the robbers. That means Christ, who is the true Israel, the true Yashirel, uh, the upright God, uh, was given into the hands of sinners and crucified at the hands of sinful men and women. Who gave Jacob for a spoil and Israel to the robbers? Did not Yahovah, he against whom we have sinned? For they would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient to his law. So that speaks of mortals and devils, you see. Uh, so mankind had been given for a spoil, right? And Yashirel was given to the robbers. Of course, we know Barabbas, who was a robber, was liberated. And two robbers were crucified either side of Christ. So it should have been three robbers crucified that day. But Barabbas, which means son of the father, Bar-Abar, son of the father, Baravar. Baravas, son of the father, Baravar, was released, a murderer. And Christ was crucified in the will of God, predestinate. Uh, foreknowledge of Elohai Yahuwah. So Israel was given to the robbers and we know um, that Israel was no longer the Romans were the robbers, you see, in around AD 70, three decades after the ascension, uh, Israel was no longer a nation. They no longer had priests, prophets, king. None of those things for 1870 years until 1948. And even then, they still haven't got proper prophets or priests. But at any rate, Israel was given to the robbers, the Romans, destroyed the temple, and Israel was not a nation from AD 70 until 1948. So Israel was given to the robbers, you see, so that's the other application of the book. And we know that uh, Yaakov was for a spoil. We know that that culminated in World War II um, when the wicked Hitlerian regime terribly, terribly oppressed and murdered millions of Yahudis. So it's a simple question, and it is Isaiah 42, 24, 4, double two, four. Who gave Jacob for a spoil and Israel to the robbers? Did not Yehovah the Lord? He against whom we have sinned, for they would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient to his law. Therefore he hath poured upon him the fury of his anger and the strength of battle, and it hath set him on fire round about, yet he knew not, and it burned him, yet he laid it not to heart. Now, it's a very interesting verse. Now, this has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ, you see. Um, the fury of God, the wrath of God, it pleased Yahweh to lay upon him the iniquity of us all. Um, the strength of battle, the fury of his anger, it set him on fire round about, yet he knew not, and it burned him, yet it, he laid it not to hard. So this has to do with the judgment and the fury experienced by Israel, by the Jews. Uh, and they didn't properly realize why Elohai Yahweh was so angry. Uh, and of course, it uh, culminated in the, the ovens uh, where they cremated uh, many, many hundreds of thousands of, uh, of Jews were cremated, many others were shot and buried in mass graves, millions of them all told. And there's the scripture. Um, he's poured upon him, upon Israel, the fury of his anger, the strength of battle, it set him up way around about. He knew not it burned him, yet it, he laid it not to heart. Very few of those Jews that suffered terribly realized that they were paying for the sins of their fathers in rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ and stating clearly when Pontius Pilate 
said, I wash my hands of this. And they said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Well, they didn't realize what they were saying, that they were about to lose their country because of their rejection of Christ Jesus. They didn't realize the terrible things that would come upon the Yahudis in many successive generations. But now, things are much better now. We are now at the end of the church age. Uh, it is the church that has caused Israel to be, well, it's Elohai Yahweh is the source of everything, the source of all nations and all mortals through the church has established Israel as a nation again after World War II in 1948. Um, and also at the present time, we know that many Yahudis in Israel at the present time, many Jews know that their military power, their safety and security comes from the Christianized nations. Um, and so many of them are jealous and they will realize uh, that their Messiah, that many of them think is still yet to come, which of course is true as well, ironically enough, uh, they don't realize that the non-Jewish mortals for two millennia have been worshipping, loving and obeying their Messiah, whom they rejected. And so Christ, through the assembly, through the Gentile assembly, uh, has re-established uh, those that crucified him, the Jews, back in the land where he was crucified. Uh, and Jerusalem came under the control of the Jews from 1967. Actually, uh, the... Um, the 7th of June, 1967, which in America is 6767. They put the month before the day. So in America, June, the 6th month, June, the 7th day, 67, 6767. Now in Britain, we would put 7667, see? 7667, 7th of June, 1967, was when there was the six-day war and the Jews conquered the whole of Jerusalem. Okay, now, that was now, goodness, 54 years ago, 54 earth years ago. It's nearly time now. Friends, you see, the word of the Lord will go forth from Jerusalem. All flesh will come to worship at Jerusalem. This whole earth will do the will of Elohim, Yahweh. Ye will all do exactly as Elohim, Yahweh says. You will all need to learn to speak properly. All of you. Now. So it's a clear declaration. Um, yes. So that brings us to the end of that chapter here. Can I thank you so much for tuning in. Um, we'll be back with another recording in the near future. So until next time, the face of Elohai, your God and King, give you peace and strength and blessing in every way, you and your families. Until next time, shalom, shalom.